Happy Friday, everyone. It's John Lorden here with another episode of Brain Scratch. Thank you so much for joining me here today. I really appreciate you guys spending your time with me. Today's a bit of a strange one. I don't know if I've looked into a case quite like this before. Essentially, it's a brain scratch case, but it's also kind of a searchlight case. There's not a ton of information about each of them in their own right. I don't even know if I could cover them individually because there's such limited information, but together it kind of made sense to me. And that leaves us with a bigger mystery of, are these two events connected in some way? Is someone trying to terrorize a family or is this just some bizarre, extremely bad luck and wicked chance that this has happened this way? Uh, let's keep that in mind as we learn about this mystery. It takes place in Oroville, California. We're going to start at Wikipedia to learn more about that. Apparently, Oro means gold in Spanish, and this was named Oroville in the mid-1800s. Sounds like uh, they were trying to entice some people that might be looking for gold to head up the coast a little bit, a little closer uh, to Northern California. Oroville is the county seat of Butte County, California, United States. The population was 15,506 at the 2010 census. The city of Chico, California is located about 22 miles northwest of the city, and the state capital of Sacramento lies about an hour due south. Chico is kind of known as a, a college town. It's in Northern California, kind of, I'd say in the heart of Northern California. Um, and if we take a look at this screenshot, it just looks like cozy Main Street, USA, you know, any town USA type of, of place. So what could have happened here? Well, this mystery starts with an obituary. And uh, unfortunately, in this line of work, I do look at obituaries frequently. I can say some of them are exceptionally written. Uh, I frequently like to include them because it lets us know more about the person, uh, what their likes and dislikes are, what their family is like. Here, we don't have any of that going on. Obituary of Greta Putnam. Greta Jane Putnam passed away on November 8th, 2018 in Oroville, California. No public services will be held per her request. Arrangements are entrusted to Ramsey Funeral Home, and then they have a phone number. But you notice there's another difference with this obituary than many of the others that I have seen online. Um, it doesn't talk about peacefully passing away. And that is certainly the case here. Despite the fact that we have a woman in her 80s, what we're talking about, unfortunately, here's a picture of Greta, uh, is a homicide, very clearly a homicide. Now, we don't have a ton of details about why police have come to that conclusion, but they are saying this is the kind of stuff that gives them nightmares. Uh, so it was apparently a pr pretty horrific scene that they walked into. Uh, let's move forward to ChicoER.com and see what else we can learn. This is an article from November 9th, 2018. An 86-year-old woman was found dead in a home in the Cottonwood Estates mobile home park on Thursday morning. At about 9 a.m., Oroville police officers were dispatched to the home on Cottonwood Circle regarding an unresponsive person. Officers entered the home and found the woman. The victim of homicide was Greta Putnam. So here we're learning that it is a homicide. Uh, I've seen other information that suggests that a friend or a neighbor is who originally found Greta and then called it in to police. Um, but still not a whole lot of detail. Let's see what else we can learn. Another article from Chico ER, uh, this one from November 20th, 2018. A horrific case that is keeping investigators up at night. Lieutenant Chris Nicodemus said Tuesday, the slaying of an 86-year-old woman who was found dead in her home November 8th must be resolved. Greta Putnam was brutally murdered in her home. That's a direct quote from him. And the case is among the most horrific Nicodemus has seen in his 20 years in law enforcement. Sounds terrible. Something really bad happened to this 86-year-old woman. And I just, right off the bat, you have to wonder, what's the motive? Why did someone do this to this lady that... If we look at her photo, by all accounts, I think she looks like my grandma, looks like your grandma. What What is going on here that someone would have to end this 86-year-old woman's life? Uh, 
Nicodemus said a suspect has not yet been identified, and he withheld details of the case, citing the ongoing investigation. But he did say there were obvious signs that Putnam, described as well-liked in her senior living community, was murdered, and investigators have been working on the case every day. Nicodemus said the timing of Putnam's discovery was affected, affected by the destructive campfire. So the campfire has been big news here in the United States. I know that I have international viewers as well. So I'm going to do just a little history on that over at Wikipedia. We're going to learn about the campfire from 2018. It was the deadliest wildfire in the United States since 1918 and the sixth deadliest U.S. wildfire overall. Named after Camp Creek Road, its place of origin, the fire started on November 8, 2018 in Butte County in Northern California. The fire caused at least 86 civilian fatalities, injured 12 civilians and five firefighters, covered an area of over 150,000 acres, and destroyed 18,804 structures, with most of the damage occurring within the first two days. The fire reached 100% containment after 17 days on November 25th, 2018. And I can tell you when I was doing research for this case, uh, the campfire is still being investigated. They're drilling in on what might have been the cause of the campfire, the scene where it actually started. Some interesting developments going there, not really related to this case, but you guys might want to uh, Google it if you want to know more about the developments on the campfire. So the campfire was reported originally at 6.30 a.m. on November 8th, same morning, and went on to become the most deadly and destructive wildfire in California history. The lieutenant said the police department had resources working on the homicide case, but not all its resources. Other police personnel were assigned to help with the fire. So we already have a little bit of a knock in terms of the resources that are being allocated to Greta's case. Does that affect the investigation? There's not a whole lot of information out there, but they're being pretty clear here that in some way, yes, it did affect the investigation because they would have had more personnel and more resources responding to that scene. Does that necessarily mean investigators, particularly for a homicide, that they would have been assigned to other areas for working with the fire? I don't know. Uh, the fire was pretty early on at that point, but if they had any casualties already happening, possibly, even possibly those investigators could have been dispatched. So certainly a lot to consider when we have emergency resources that are already being stretched thin. And now we have this happen. So far, there has not been a big break in the case, Nicodemus said, and no arrests have been announced. But the lieutenant said the State Department of Justice has been assisting police. Police have sent evidence off for DNA analysis, and investigators are continuing to hunt down leads and possible surveillance footage. We're going to look at a map a little bit later. I think there are several places where they might be able to get surveillance footage. We'll, we'll take a look at that together. The lieutenant said Putnam's killing was not the result of a drug ripoff or gang shooting. It was that of a woman who apparently had no enemies in her quiet community. Very strange. And I almost wish they would have just given us the original quote here. I don't know if he was talking about drug ripoffs and gang shootings being the norm for homicides that he deals with, or if there was some particular reason why he was trying to associate a drug ripoff or a gang shooting. I don't know if there's a rumor circulating out there that perhaps there was some form of drug ripoff or this was gang related in some way. Um, I would tend to think not, but I just I wish we had the original source quote so we could make that determination for ourselves. Moving over to krcrtv.com, uh, an article from December 5th, 2018, also has an accompanying video segment you might want to check out. Of course, I'll have all these links in the description box below so you can go through them if you would like to as well. While the campfire has dominated headlines in Butte County and across the country, the family of an 86-year-old woman is waiting for answers about her apparent murder. And here we actually at least have a sign of the mobile home park. Uh, it is a senior mobile home park, we can see from that, and we'll get some more views of it once we get to the map. Sometime around the 8th of November, her life was taken and by who we don't even know, said Donnie Rhodes, the grandson of beloved 86-year-old Greta Putnam. Donnie and his twin brother, Ron Rhodes, are desperately looking for answers as to who and why their grandmother was killed. They describe their grandmother as generous and loving and who is greatly missed. 
everybody in this park knew my grandmother and there's not one bad remark anybody can say about her, said Ron. And here we actually have an image of both Donnie and Ron as they're being interviewed. It's been weeks since her death, but memories inside her home are still there. Her belongings are neatly being packed up and boxed as they move her belongings out of her home. However, their grandmother's chair still sits in the living room empty. Ron said her presence remains. Her spirit's right there. That's the last place I saw her, said Ron. And of course, they even got a picture of her chair here. There is still a murderer out there running around, and that's the scary thing. Not just for me in closure, my brother for closure. It's somebody still out there, and it can happen to anyone, said Donnie. Yeah, um, and this family has a bit more reason to be concerned. We will get to that, but let's continue with more information on this at actionnewsnow.com. Uh, we can see there's another video clip here. I've actually stopped it at this particular place because I wanted to show another picture of Greta. Oroville police are calling the murder of 86-year-old Greta Putnam their top priority. And this is an article from December 6th, 2018. No word on a motive yet. Police are investigating several leads, including the church next to the victim's home where homeless people have been spotted. Uh, kind of interesting that a church would be called out in an article like this. And I can tell you, if you look at the comments below that article, uh, many people are taking some offense to the way that things are phrased. Uh, the article is basically a rewrite of the video segment. And I have to admit there's some things about it that are a little clunky, possibly a little insensitive. I don't think that was the intent of the author of either the video piece or the written segment, but I understand uh, why people are are feeling that way about it. Uh, could have It could have been done a little bit differently. So here we're taking a look at the Cottonwood Estates. This is the uh, mobile home park right here. And as you can see, this design is pretty much a one way in, one way out situation, except there is also a dirt road that runs on the left side of the entrance. Uh, let me go ahead and drop down to street level so you can kind of see it from there. Uh, this is actually the gas station across the street, which by the way, I would absolutely have gone to uh, and tried to get video from. Uh, it's quite possible that if someone did do this and if they were driving at all, if they have cameras that are facing this street, they might have that person on camera. But here we can see the uh, mobile home entrance. And you can see there's kind of a community building up here too. I don't know if there's an office. It looks like there's an office kind of off to the left here. Possibly some cameras could be around this as well. Not necessarily though. I think the likelihood of it being at the gas station is a lot higher because you have their pumps, you have ATMs typically at gas stations, uh, a lot more things to protect. But if we look to the left of the entrance, there is this kind of dirt road that circles around the park. It kind of goes along the side. You can obviously take a vehicle on that. And unfortunately, Google won't go down there, but I've looked at it from the overhead view and it does appear that there's not a solid fence I do believe there's sections in here where you could possibly get through. Now, one of the videos I watched had a reporter that was speaking uh, and she had the church behind her. The church is on the right side of the entrance. We can see it over here. Uh, let me go ahead and drop down to the street view for the church. And it always wants to face the gas station for some reason. Um, so to the right of the entrance for the mobile home park, this is the church. It looks like it might have used to be, used to have been a hotel or something, and maybe it's been converted. Um, but there is a fence that is between um, the mobile home park and the church, but it's extremely low. It's a wooden fence that is maybe three feet tall. And even in the segment that I saw with the reporter, there are breaks in that fence. You could easily walk through the fence. Uh, here you can get a little bit of a sense of it. You can see it's really short, but there are segments where there's no fence at all and you can just easily walk through. Even if there wasn't those segments, you know, any adults could pretty much step over this. So, um, it is interesting that they're considering that there might be a homeless population that is showing up at the church. I think that that's probably a pretty common thing for a lot of good, caring churches that are trying to help the community. I don't know why that is necessarily an investigative lead. I think it's something that should certainly be looked into, but I don't know why that got to the media, why that would be reported unless there was something specific that was said by a investigator to the media about that. I'm, I'm really not sure uh, why that, that came up in the news article. 
But, you know, it's weird. Somewhere in here, uh, I'm not sure exactly where her home is, but somewhere in here it happened. And like I said, if that person was in a vehicle, they came out here and they were driving right towards where this gas station is. Uh, outside of that, you have a lot of commerce around here. Um, there is essentially a strip mall down here. There is some new construction that's going on the right here, so I would assume that any camera systems they have are probably not active yet. Um, but if you drop south of here, you get a lot more businesses, a lot stronger likelihood that there is some type of camera that is hitting this road. So if a vehicle is involved, which uh, I think is an important consideration, because if we're talking about you know, this was potentially someone that was on foot. Uh, they might have not come out this way at all. Looking at how that fence is between on the north side of the mobile home park, they could have just hopped the fence. You can see there is kind of open fields that are back here. They could have cut, a, cut across the field. We've got that road that's winding all along the south border. They could have cut out to where that road is. It does look like there is another entrance um, kind of close to that road right about here. I don't know if that's gated or not. It sure doesn't look like it from the aerial. Of course, we, we can't really get in much closer than that. So a lot of considerations uh, just when you're checking the map on this, trying to understand where it happened and what would have been the escape route for the person that's involved. But I do think there is a chance. I don't know how strong the chance is, but there is a good avenue of investigation looking at surveillance uh, for many of these businesses that are around the mobile home park. Let's go back to the article and continue with another very interesting detail that is the start of the second mystery that we're talking about today and the third that we touched on at the start of this video. Police say they are also looking for Ms. Putnam's relative, 21-year-old Dominic Potts, in connection to the case. He has been missing since Ms. Putnam's body was discovered. Potts' car was found abandoned about a month ago near Chester. Plumas County Police are working with Oroville Police on the investigation. Now, one critique about this article um, that I agree with people about is there's a very important fact that's being omitted from this from this uh, blurb here, and it's it's unfortunate because you know the lead in for this blurb is talking about who they're looking into potentially as being related to this case. Uh, you know, I mean, they're, they're following leads with the church and the victim's home where homeless people have been spotted. That is a pretty leading statement to saying, wow, they think that the killer might be a homeless person that came, you know, jumped across the fence or walked over the fence. But now they're going to this conversation about, oh, she's also got another relative who's only 21 years old and happens to be missing. He went, he went missing before this happened. Now, I think that's an important fact to consider. When you leave that fact out, it certainly leads your mind down a very specific path uh, for some of us. Some of us would say, wow, did he do something? Did he go see his grandma? Is this a robbery that we don't know about because there was some family heirlooms that he took that you know haven't been accounted for or something along those lines? But knowing that he actually was missing a few days before this, I think changes the game a little. And we've got some other stuff that we're going to look into on that as well. There is also some rumors spinning around uh, what was going on with Dominic, uh, which we're just going to touch on at the very end. You guys know I, I don't typically include that type of information in these reviews, but it's just a theory. That's basically how we're going to cover it. It's one possibility that's being spoken about with this case, but let's continue with what we can truly learn from the articles. The family continues to search for answers. In a written statement to Action News Now, they describe Ms. Putnam as a loving and positive person. You could always find her outside in her power chair, watering her flowers or blowing the leaves off her front porch. She loved being outside. She lived a full, extraordinary life. From modeling in her early 30s to becoming her own broker for Century 21, she did it all. You name it, she did it. Anyone with information that could assist in the investigation is encouraged to contact the Oroville police. And I actually have contact information down below for Greta's case and also for Dominic's case. So we've got two separate departments that would need to be contacted uh, depending on who you have information for. I've got that broken out in the description box below. 
This case was originally brought to me by a very caring brain scratcher that has been hearing a bit of the rumor mill churn on this case. So uh, she's been keeping me updated about that stuff, but also giving me some of the links that are actually being presented here today. I believe that Dominic is Greta's great grandson. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think any of these articles really detail the connection between these two people outside of saying that they're related, but I believe Dominic is actually Greta's great grandson. Let's continue here at plumasnews.com and learn about the case of missing person Dominic Potts. According to the Plumas County Sheriff's Office, Dominic Potts was reported missing by his family November 6th. So if we start kind of trying to formulate some type of timeline here, um, we have his report of being missing November 6th. We have Greta's body being discovered the morning of November 8th. Uh, this family, to have two things happen like this in that close of a period of time, let me just say, I, I am deeply feeling for these people. It is hard enough dealing with having a missing loved one it's another entire thing when we lose someone that's close to us that is getting up in age, but it's another complete thing when that turns out to actually be a homicide. So we have something really bizarre going on here, and that's why I asked at the start of this video, is someone getting at this family? Is someone trying to hurt maybe someone else in this family by these, these two instances? Um, or are they related in some other way? Now, the rumor mill aspect, um, from what I've been hearing, I don't think the family is really subscribing to these two things being connected. I have to tell you, just with my experience of looking into hundreds of cases now, the likelihood of these two events happening this close and not being related, I think, I don't know how small it is, but I think it's less than the chance that these are somehow related. Um, it's just, it's too tight. This window is too close. Is this all related to the fire? I don't know. That's, that's a completely different thing. We don't have a linkage necessarily directly between Dominic, uh, Greta and the fire. What we do have are two family members. One of them has been found dead. The other one is missing. Their vehicle has been found. Very, very bizarre for these things to be happening so close in time. And, that's one of the big questions of this case. Is that beyond chance? Is that really pointing us in the direction that there's something else at play here? My gut, and it is just my gut, just based on the cases I've reviewed here, is that there's something else at play here, and we don't know what it is. Do investigators know what it is? Possibly. Uh, continuing here, uh, Dominic was last seen at a Greenville residence during the evening of November 4th. And on November 8th, his vehicle was located near Chester. So not only do we have his report not going until November 6th, he's actually not seen after November 4th. So if we are trying to put some kind of timeline together here, he's disappearing the evening of November 4th. Um, what I really wish we had was some type of estimated time of death for Greta. And I have not seen any solid information on that. We know she's found in the morning. So I'm kind of assuming that it was likely the night before uh, that the attack to her happened. Uh, but it could have even been before that. Would it have been several days before that? I don't think so. I am more than certain that at least with the limited way that they're talking about this case to the media, I think that fact would have came out. That you know we found her, but obviously um, it had been two or three days uh, between when this happened to her and when we found her. And we're not hearing that type of information. So um, I believe that she was found probably within a reasonable time frame, maybe 12 hours or something along those lines. But we don't, I don't have an autopsy report. I don't have any science to point to for that. I'm just telling you guys what I think we would have heard if it was different. And I'm trying to understand that timeline to understand the possibility that is there someone that took Dominic? And is that same person potentially the person that harmed Greta? That's why I think it's really important to get that timeline kind of firmed up and to understand it better. And for any of the family that's watching this, part of what I'm trying to do here is give you guys um, the, the points to try to drill in on 
to find these answers for yourself as well. And I know the family is already working on a timeline. Uh, we're going to touch on uh, some information that's coming out through a Facebook page that uh, is essentially working with them on Dominic's case. But um, it's really important that we try to firm that up. Here at actionnewsnow.com, we have a photo of his truck that was found in Chester. Uh, Potts worked for Diggit Construction in Chester, California, and resided in Greenville. So now the story is starting to fill out a little bit. We know that he was last seen in Greenville, and we know his truck is found in Chester. So two places where he would normally be. His mother told Action News Now that his truck was seen at the end of First Avenue in Chester near Lake Almanor. Uh, let's pull up another map and try to make some sense out of all this. So I've got a few points already marked here. Greenville is where he lived. Uh, he worked approximately 25 miles away in Chester. This is what I believe the road that she was talking about uh, that runs close to the water here. I believe this is where the truck was found. But Greta's home is way south of that. We're talking about 90 miles away um, from, well, from Chester and even more from Greenville. I guess there's a different route, so uh, you might be able to tighten that up. Yeah, Greenville, it looks like it might be 80 miles or maybe even 75, something along those lines, but uh, not exactly geographically connected. So if this is someone that is trying to hurt this family in some way, they have information. Like, how would they know where Dominic's great grandmother lives? Uh, you know, especially considering that it's that far away. Um, is there ways? Yes, certainly. People could have been following other family members, could have seen them driving out there, um, you know, digging around online, going through mail. I understand there's other ways to come to that. I'm just saying that it would take a bit of work. It's not quite the same as, you know, his grandmother lived next door to him or in the same home as him. He's gone missing and she wound up murdered. Um, we've got some considerable geographic distance that's going on here. It's still a drive. I mean, it's reasonable. It's reasonable to be able to do this if you have a vehicle, which once again, is making me wonder about that surveillance footage in particular around the mobile home park. Uh, but let's get back to the article here. Uh, Dominic's mother, Sesha Putnam, also said the area where his truck was found has been searched by citizens on foot, local search and rescue, and with ATVs and an airplane. And of course, with missing persons cases, you know, we're always nervous when things are found around a body of water. I don't know how many operations have been done actually in the water. Um, we're not really getting that from that article, but I would like to hope that law enforcement is getting some resources and searching the water as well. Hat Creek Construction is offering a $5,000 reward for any information about his whereabouts. Dominic's father works for the construction company. It always warms my heart. I look for the bright spots in these stories. Hat Creek Construction putting up that money as a reward for information in this case, I think is pretty amazing and uh, shows that they care about Dominic's father and uh, his family as well. So I really appreciate them doing that. So what else can we learn about this case? We're going to take a look at the Find Dominic Potts Facebook. Uh, this is a post that they did on December 8th. Hi, y'all. I just wanted to confirm some things. Bear with me as I'm trying to get the most accurate info. There is some speculation that Dominic was last seen with a passenger. There are lots of speculations and rumors, but no hard evidence suggesting he was with someone. Just hearsay. What we really need to know is when people last saw or talked to him. That's part of the reason why we're doing this video. That's part of the reason why I want you to see his face. Here is, uh, I think this is one of the last known photos right before his disappearance. So this is a good shot of what he should have looked like around that time. That's why I want you guys to take a look at this truck. Maybe you recognize this truck being somewhere at some time that is part of this case. We want to help them get the best and accurate information. So hopefully these both these cases can be cracked. There's a big chunk of time missing. So I urge everyone with reliable information to contact the Plumas County Sheriff's Office at 530-283-6300. I have that information also down below in the description box. We are trying to get reliable and accurate information as much as possible. Cameras, messages, phone calls, and hard proof to when someone has talked or last seen him. 
Right now, there is no confirmations per law enforcement. He was he was last seen with someone. But again, no lead is too small. But it's important we report all the info to the police so that they can follow up and look further into it. And I could not agree more. This page is to try to keep everyone informed on most accurate info that we know is confirmed. The more info we can get to the cops, the better. But please keep in mind, hearsay is not the same as evidence in police work. I report and run everything by Sesha and family to make sure it's accurate and we'll continue to do so to make sure we're all on the same page. Thank you. The page that came from is facebook.com forward slash find Dominic Potts. Of course, I'll have a link to that in the description box below as well. Uh, Please come here. You can see numerous photos of him. Uh, You can like the page. You can be sure to follow it for updates. Uh, As a matter of fact, let's read the latest update here, uh, which is actually from yesterday. I have no doubt the truth will prevail. We all want Dominic back home. Please, if you have any reliable information on his last whereabouts, come forward. Hashtag bring him home. Hashtag we won't give up. Hashtag find Dominic. So I mentioned earlier, there is a rumor mill swirling around this. So now we're going to talk about what potentially could be going on here. And we're going to review. I believe this is probably the most popular of the rumors uh, because this is essentially what I heard when I was first introduced to this story. So I know that this story is getting around. It's now even been posted on Reddit by someone. Unconfirmed information. Dominic had supposedly gotten in with a pretty rough crowd and had started doing drugs. When his vehicle was found, it was in reverse with the key switched to on and police disturbed any potential evidence when searching it for drugs. Sometime before Dominic went missing, he allegedly went to some friends saying that somebody was shooting at him from the docks and that the Hell's Angels were after him. Nobody really believed him as he was allegedly high and things like that don't really happen in that area. So I have to say all the information in that specific unconfirmed information blurb uh, has been given to me by the brain scratcher that has been talking to me about this case as well uh, in different pieces, but all these facts are lining up uh, with what she has told me previously. Does that mean that it's anything more than a rumor? Not necessarily. I just want to be clear with you guys that that is the talk that's going on around this case. Uh, We've reviewed all the media that's been available for this case. Unfortunately, we don't have any real hard documentation to look at. We don't have the autopsy report to look at. Um, The investigators are releasing. I mean, I shared it with you guys. It's really small pieces of information. But when we boil this down to the basics of the cases, there's two cases we're talking about here. Something is strange. And it'd be a whole different thing if you know, Greta was found deceased and Dominic went missing at that time or a day later or something along those lines. The fact that he goes missing first, and if this is true, that he's been talking to people about the fact that he thinks someone's after him, and I don't know if it's Hell's Angels or not. I don't I don't think that ultimately that's all that important. What is important is who's the specific person that's after him. I don't I don't care what they associate with. Um Someone he's he's supposedly talking to people about someone being after him. His great grandmother winds up dead, and he winds up missing. It's it just it seems like it's too much. And I know part of that equation is unconfirmed information, but it just seems like there is too much going on. Even if we remove that that contingency about him talking, having a murder and having a missing person case strike within the same family within a matter of days. For me personally, it just seems like it's too much. It seems very clear that something is going on here. Uh, What that leads to, I don't know. And what type of, uh, is it Hell's Angels? Is it some stalker? Is it something not related to Dominic in particular, but some other part of the family? That's the thing that kind of nags at me about this is if you really wanted to hurt someone, yeah, you could go and end their life or you can go and attack them or something like that. I don't think Greta was that person. So, and even by the accounts we heard from her grandchildren, no one thinks that she had any enemies. No one thinks that she was targeted for that specific reason. Uh, It doesn't look like this is a robbery. 
there doesn't appear to be anything that was missing from the home. We haven't heard of any other type of analysis of what the motive could be. Uh, it seems like police don't exactly understand the motive right now. So in situations like that, I'm starting to think, who did that hurt? Who did murdering Greta affect and hurt? Now, if it was Dominic that they were trying to affect and hurt, why does he go missing before that actually happens to Greta? That's not logical either. That doesn't make sense. Um, so I'd be wondering about the connectivity between Dominic and Greta in terms of family and friends and all that, and who and look at it almost as who would be affected most by losing these two people. And I would start running through their life looking for um, what's what's going on. Is there someone that wants to hurt this person in this way or wants to control this person? Could be another possibility. Um, I don't know. There's there's just there's a weird aspect to this case that's going on that. Quite honestly, I haven't seen before, and that's a big part of the reason why I wanted to share it with you guys. Now, unfortunately, I did take a look at Namus and last name Potts, state of California. Absolutely no cases found here. So I don't think Dominic has been entered in, into Namus. Quite honestly, I don't think I have enough details to enter him myself in here. Uh, if any of the family happens to see this, you really want to get him entered in a NamUs. If you need any help with that, please feel free to reach out to me. I've already got an account with them. I know how to register someone in there. I just have some questions I would need you to answer. You can email me directly at john at lordinarts, just like it's spelled in the channel name down below, dot com. John with an H at lordinarts.com. Um, but outside of that, it, it is possible that it's been entered, but it's not active yet. It's possible. Sometimes law enforcement does it. Most of the time they don't. So we really want to get someone on that. Uh, maybe even the Facebook administrator could help with that in some way. Just I want to make sure that uh, we get his record entered into NamUs. It's the national database, and uh, it's helpful in so many different ways. I don't want to go over them all again in this video, but... Uh, I think that's an important next step for Dominic's case in particular. And this is one I'll certainly be keeping an eye on. Um, it breaks my heart that this grandmother uh, had her life ended in this way. And why would someone do that is a question that I think is going to nag at me for a long time. And I do hope that we get the answers. I'm wishing all the luck in the world to the investigators working on both of these cases. And once again, uh, my heart really goes out to this family to have um, two situations like this happen, even within the same year, let alone within the same week. Um, it, it's got to be extremely, extremely tough. So if you are a friend of this family, um, please do me a favor and give them an extra hug, give them an extra phone call, be there to support them, maybe take a meal over to their house. These are the times where they really need that type of help. Uh, and you might be the person that's able to do that for the rest of us out here that are watching and caring and hoping for a good outcome on both these cases. All right, before we get started with the review of comments from last week's episode of Brain Scratch, I've got some people to thank. These are people that are donating to the channel through PayPal, starting with Jennifer Wilson. Jennifer, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Also, William Fuller with a big donation. It's a donation for the whole year. Um, William, I really, really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Next year is going to be a big year for the channel, and that's really going to help me get some things where I need them to be to take on a few big special projects that are coming up that I'll let all of you guys know about very soon. And finally, uh, another donation from Alyssa Oliver. Thank you guys so much. I really can't do this without you. And of course, um, I love it when we're able to help families in need. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't see any GoFundMes or anything for this case. I certainly would have donated to that. Might be another idea um, for the friends and family to possibly get something together so people can help in the search for Dominic. So last week's episode was Who Shot Ashley Oakland? That's the case of a real estate agent that was shot in a... Uh, a model home in a new development. Uh, we had someone reach out that seems to know a bit more about the situation. So let's start with a comment from Lindsay A. She was working there. This was a larger brand new development with construction still going on. She was not sexually assaulted. I think the scorn lover theory was thrown out very early on. Her relationship with her boyfriend was excellent. My friend was her partner at work. 
They both worked out of that model home. It was their office, typically not at the same time though. I think the consensus is a coworker or a competitor, around here anyways. I sent this to investigators to watch, along with my friend who worked alongside her and to Ashley's brother. Lindsay, thank you so much for the additional information and for sending that video around. I really appreciate it, and I really, really hope that the investigators, Ashley's family, uh, the friend that worked with her, I hope that they see something helpful in that video. Maybe it'll nudge a memory, maybe it'll tickle some different avenue of investigation that they hadn't thought of, something along those lines. That's ultimately my biggest hope in doing this type of work. But thank you for reaching out, Lindsay. Dr. Gunsmith, regular commenter, longtime Brain Scratch fan, sounds like a professional hit. Usually a hitman would shoot the chest first to down someone, then one to the head as a finisher. Hope the family gets closure. Uh, Dr. Gunsmith, I think you make a really good point there. Uh, and I agree with you. There's an aspect to this case where it doesn't feel like a personal attack. I think with the Lindsay Buziak case, um, at least the limited details that we do have of the attack that happened to her felt much more personal in nature. Um, this does have kind of what I consider like a, disassoci a disassociation going on with it. Um, you know, two shots, nothing taken, no assaults outside of that. It does seem like someone that is kind of disconnected from her and it just doesn't necessarily feel like a crime of passion. On to another comment from Silver Amaryllis. I think the woman who found her knows something and can't say what she knows for some reason. Uh, that sums up a bit of a conversation thread I saw that was going on uh, about her and just the fact that she tried to take her own life. And a lot of people didn't really understand that. Um, and I got to tell you guys, I kind of struggle with it too. I just don't understand why she would go to that extreme. But some people made some very good points. We don't know her personally. We don't know what her personality is like. We don't know what other stressors could have been going on in her life to lead her to, to even consider doing something like that. Uh, it could just be that this was almost the straw that broke the camel's back type situation. Um, but it still makes me wonder. It still makes me wonder, does she have some more information that she was willing to share? Or even in an unreasonable way, did she feel like she somehow could have affected the outcome and that she missed the opportunity? Uh, which I, I would hope not. I would hope that someone isn't torturing themselves in that way. You know, If I, only I had gotten there two minutes sooner, maybe I would have seen someone or, or something along those lines. But uh, people sometimes do stuff like that. So we do have to keep that in consideration. And thank you, Brain Scratchers, for kind of discussing both sides of that point of view and doing it pretty respectfully. I really appreciate that. Little Teeth Keith says, I bought three houses and sold two since 2007. In each of the three I bought, I first had to meet the agent at his or her office with my pre-approval mortgage statement from my bank. While at that office, all of my personal information, including a photocopy of my driver's license, was handed over to the real estate firm. Long story short, they knew who I was, and I assure you, more than one person at the real estate company spoke with me face-to-face -face in their office that day. Looking back on it, I think that was their way of protecting their agents. Plus, it gives them an opportunity to feel me out a little as far as a sale goes. I know not every transaction works like mine, but I think more effort needs to be made to protect these folks as they do their jobs, which are often at odd hours of the day and sometimes night. Uh, Keith, really, really good insight. And I agree with you. I think more can always be done. This is going to be one of those security risks where there's constantly things that are going to evolve in terms of the risk that can inherently happen. Um, you know, people will try to be more clever about these situations. Maybe they will show up to the real estate office, but they will pass off a bum ID and be in disguise or something along those lines. So it feels like uh, there needs to be a constant effort to make sure that these processes are as solid as they can be for keeping agents safe. Because yes, they're meeting strange people on a day-to-day -day basis, going to locations they're ultimately not all that familiar with on a day-to-day -day basis, day and night, weekdays, weekends. Um, yeah, th that makes for a lot of variables and their safety has to consider all those variables. So I do think it should be, there should be like a committee 
you know, um, and and I think that we saw that in last week's story that there are some organizations that have kind of been put together around all this. Just those committees working together in an ongoing effort. Maybe have a meeting every year, an annual review of the safety procedures, and then some type of publicity thing where they're able to um, take their best practices and filter them down to all the other companies. You know, everyone working together to really get those best practices and keep their agents safe. The Erie Ferry says, I worked in apartment management for nine years. We held IDs in the office before and while we did the tour, or they didn't go on the tour, period. We also had to write down their name and contact info on a guest card and leave it in the locked office with their ID. Even if I were working by myself, it would still help protect me. I also always took my phone and pepper spray on my keychain. When coworkers were there, I'd also take the walkie, and we had a code like... Work order needed for apartment 293, which would signal to the office and maintenance that I was in trouble without tipping it off to the perp. There was no apartment 293. It only went up to 292, but the perp would most likely not know that. Erie Ferry, thank you so much for sharing that. Some really good ideas for safety in there. And absolutely, uh, apartment management. Also, at least the location is kind of locked in, but just as risky. You're meeting people you don't know and uh, having good safety practices around that. Also, a very smart thing. So uh, thanks to everyone that really contributed to the conversation on last week's episode. And we will keep our eyes on that case as well. If there's any new developments, I'll be sure to tell you about them here on the channel. Take care, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend and come back on Monday for a new episode of Case Cracked here on the Lord and Arts channel.